of God. He's talking about having His faith and how His faith can come into our lives. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespass. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. trespasses. Obviously, it's not talking about our faith in him, because let me make it very clear. Our faith, our human faith, our own belief in Him cannot move mountains. It is His faith, the substance of His energy, that moves mountains. And He says that if you have faith as a mustard seed, that's very, 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 very small. You could move the mountain. You could say, mountain, be thou gone and remove from here to there and it will go. What is he illustrating? Our faith in him? No. He's talking about his faith. His gift of faith. So powerful. That if you have one tiny little atom or mustard seed of that faith, and that faith comes to the mountain and says, mountain, go. And the mountain says, yes, 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 yes. You see the comparison. All these illustrations are already giving us a clue. There is a substance of his faith and energy that gives to us. Now, if faith and the operation of faith in the new covenant is just his faith coming through us, not our own faith, then there is a simple principle. How to turn on the tap. That's all. He's not asking us to try to believe. He's asking us how to release His faith to us. Correct? If theologically, all that we have to do is depend on His substance of energy and faith coming into us to help us. And remember, we talk about quantum. It comes in measures. Measure by measure. The word measure, you can replace the word quantum in a certain quantity at a time. So it comes measure by measure into our lives. Then the only problem would be to make sure we don't block that faith from flowing. And since we are spirit, soul and body, which First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 tells us we are tripartite. God, he, pre, he prayed for the Thessalonians that God will preserve their spirit, soul and body blameless under His coming. So we are spirit, soul, and body. And since faith resides in our spirit, we are born again. And since God is a spirit, and our spirit is one with the Holy Spirit, then faith coming into our spirit is not a problem. But it's faith flowing from the spirit through our soul, through the body, through the physical realm. That's the problem. So the blockage is not in the spirit. The blockage is potentially... In our soul. What is our soul? Which man need in his book, The Spiritual Man, identify that the soul has three components. Intellect, emotions, and the will. So our soul consists of three areas. And how he came to that was, he analyzed every place in the Bible where the word soul occurs. And then he grouped them up. He found that part of it talked about feelings, part of it talked about thinking, part of it talked about the will. Thus he concludes that the soul has three components. 
Intellect, say intellect. Emotions, say emotions. And will, say will. Now it's obvious that if we want to have the gift of faith that God gives into our lives flowing out through our soul, you must have three parts of your soul flowing in line, correct? Not just one part. Three parts. But most people, when they exercise faith, they only use one part. The mind. So they thought that if they mentally understand the doctrine, they have it. That's only one third of your soul. So the gift of faith, which is a quanta, which needs all three to cooperate before it flows out, cannot flow out. Let's say that when you come, come up the leaf, and then there's one big door just now, and I make the door one third in size of a human being. And I don't make it horizontal, I make it this way. So you come up the leaf, you press the leaf, and you go to the third floor, and you look. How do I get in? What kind of church is this? You know, one third would be, let's say, you know, about, let's say, put it about two feet tall. So the door opens, but it's two feet tall. It, all the people in this church must be very short. <laughs> How do I get in? You can't. Because the size of an average person, every Singaporean, five feet plus. Australian, six feet plus. <laughs> Seven feet. Uh, over here, as I walk around, I'm among the tall ones. But when I walk back in Australia, I'm among the average ones. <laughs> Everyone has to look up at them. Faith can't get through. Because faith is of a certain quanta size. It needs all your soul to cooperate. That's the reason why many people, they, they name it, claim it, but couldn't get it. Because only one third of their soul is involved. You must have all three parts of your soul. You must have the mind of faith. You must have the feeling of faith and the will of faith. All cooperating together for it to work. And so all those three parts of the soul must cooperate for faith to flow fully. And we're going to tell you how to get that together. Because it's not just having the doctrine and understanding and the mental part and you say, okay, the Bible says this, I believe it, that's it. That's only one third. That is why in this same passage, Jesus deals with all three parts of your soul. He deals with all three parts of your soul. In Mark 11, when He refers to this section here, let's uh, look at Mark 11, chapter, Mark chapter 11. He says here, in verse 23, When you say to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt. Now, which part of the soul is he talking about when he says, does not doubt? Your mind. Clever. Good. Because it's a mind that doubts. So he says, this is what the mind does and your mind must get in line with God. Your mind must not doubt. I'm going to talk more about that afterwards. But I just got to point all three are inside here. And then, <coughs> he tells you here, In verse 24, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, and in some translation, whatever things you desire, ITO in the Greek, desire and ask, the word ITO is closer to the word ask, which is an act of your will. 
You want it? You ask. After, after this uh, session, some of you are going to go out for lunch, unless you're fasting the rest three days and three nights in your camp. <laughs> Good suggestion. But Albert is smiling nicely. He's going to go join me on a fast, right? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> okay. And uh, you're going to ask. You're going to, you're going to eat. And so when you go down to the stores, you choose. There's lots of stores. So you choose. And when you choose, you ask. You go to the store and say, give me some of that. And you pay for it. It's your choice. Your will is involved. Your will is involved. And, verse 25, 26, your emotions are involved. Can you see that Jesus was talking about the faith of God, which is in the Greek, in verse 22. And then he talks about the three parts of our soul that needs to be dealt with. Doubts, which is in the mind. Asking, which is part of your will. And, and, and forgiveness, which is part of your emotions. And unless we have the mind renewed to think the way faith thinks, you would be losing one third of your yieldedness. Or, if you don't have the feelings of faith flowing through you, you miss that one third. Or if your will, your asking is not persistent. Remember the story of the widow. She was persistent. She stood her ground. She was coming against the unjust judge. What was the story about? It was a story of the persistence of the will. She realized the judge. She will hang around the judge. She will follow the judge. She, will, she wants it. Her will wants it. She desires it. See, when you exercise faith, there are three aspects of the soul. They must line up with faith for faith to work. And I can sometimes see a whole group of people who are taught faith and they're walking around with one third faith. At least it's not one quarter or three quarter. Then we call, can call that tigasuku. <laughs> one third. <laughs> for those of you who don't know the language, tigasuku, what does it mean? It means something else, right? Than three quarter. <laughs> Someone was crazy or mad, huh? Or something wrong up there. It's a it's a it's a local phrase, right? That fellow is three quarters. <laughs> and uh, so we we realize that a lot of people are running around with one third faith. Oh, hallelujah! I got it! I got it! I got it! But actually, they got only one third. One third. They haven't got it yet. In order for faith to flow, we must have our mind flowing with the mind of Christ. And those are the three parts of our soul that must flow together. So, our mind must flow with the mind of Christ. And uh, for the mind of Christ, let's look at First uh, Corinthians chapter 2. So that you think the way Jesus thinks. And what would... Not only will you ask the question, what would Jesus do? But you ask, what would Jesus think in your situation? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he tells us in verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? And then the conclusion, we have the mind of Christ. And in some translations, like the Living Bible, which I don't quite recommend, it says, we have the thoughts of Christ. Not a bad phrase. We have the thoughts of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. And as I mentioned in the spiritual world, that thoughts do not just come from us. Our ability to think is a gift from God. The ability to think is caused by a light that flows within us. 
based on first uh, first Ephesians chapter one verse seventeen and eighteen, where it says the eyes of your understanding be flooded with light. What does it mean? The more light, the more you can think and see and understand. So understanding is based on light. You could base a, a, a mathematical formula on that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. I love science, I love math. You could say that your ability to understand is directly proportional to the amount of spiritual light that flows within you. Based on Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. So the more God sends His light within us, the more you can understand clearer. And it is true, because in Luke 24, Jesus just touched His disciples and they understood Scriptures. He imparted something to them. And it is true because some of you, when you're born again, you begin to see the light of truth and Scriptures clearer than before. So the understanding is from an inner light that flows. And our ability to think is not just our ability, it is dependent on the light. Just like right now you can see physically because of physical light. If you switch off all the physical light, block out all the windows, we cannot see. The eyes are there but cannot see. So the same way, if God's light is not shining in an invisible realm called the understanding and the mind, all humans will lose the ability to understand and think. This was the light that lighted all men. And it's by God's grace that He sent rain on the just and the unjust. It's by God's grace that He sustains all of physical life right now, even those who don't know Him. It's by God's grace that He's gifted to mankind the ability to understand and think. But of course, if you know Him personally, He could give you more ability, because you have discovered a source. And the wrestle in the mind is more which stream the wrong stream of negative thoughts or the positive stream of positive thoughts from heaven. That is why James chapter 1 tells us that when you pray and you ask, and in that particular instance, it talks about asking for wisdom. But it applies to all areas of prayer. It says in uh, James chapter 1, verse 5, on 5 to 8, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. See, it's talking about being double-minded or have of two minds. Those doubting. Remember Jesus said you must not doubt. Treat thoughts as a river flowing. A river flowing from God, the positive. Remember the mind of Christ? Having the mind of Christ, of course, automatically implies having the thoughts of Christ. Because mind produces thoughts. So when you you are linked up to the mind of Christ, His thoughts flow. Or when you link up to the enemy or the devil, His negative thoughts flow. And so the key in exercising faith is of course the Scriptures help. Meditating on the word help. You know why? Because the Bible is a source of the thoughts of God spoken through many ages to many men and women. So when you meditate on the word, you're tuned to what his thoughts and his mind is. The mind of God. And so the key in exercising faith, meditating on the word, but basically it's just switching on to the mind of Christ. And anything that doesn't sound like the mind of Christ, you just refuse to link up to. You just keep your mind renewed in Him. And link up to Him and you will only think the thoughts of God. Every thought that is not in line, you practice Second Corinthians chapter 10. You bring it to the subject, to the authority of Christ. And you call these the weapons of our warfare. And so as you keep linking it, it's not a very hard thing. 
All you have to do is just tap on the positive flow of God's love. And with God's love comes the thoughts. And, uh, and if your emotions are lined up to, your thoughts flow easier. You see, some people, their emotions go one way. Their thoughts are trying to reach God. And their will is half stuck there. Have you seen someone trying to walk pool three ways? Can you walk when you're pulled in three directions? No. But when all your soul is flowing in one direction, it's easy. And some people struggle to get the right thought because their feelings are going in opposite direction. And their will is not strengthened by God. So tapping onto the flow of God's thoughts is very easy. Every morning when I wake up, I just meditate on God, worship Him, and bang, all the nice thoughts are flowing. Remember, those, uh, you not only think the thoughts which is in your language, it's the thoughts beyond language. Remember how I say that when God says, I love you, we all may hear it differently. A little child you know, may hear, you know, oh, he likes me. Professor may say, you know, God's complete, unconditional, unreserved compassion is upon us. Ordinary person, God loves me. But the gist of the thoughts, his, his acceptance of you is flowing and that produces whatever positive thoughts that are there, the seed of thought. And so it's always important to remember, you are either of the stream. Now the double-minded man, he goes this way, then after he link to the other side, then link to that side, and then link to the other side, and link to that side. Of course, you can never get the faith coming. So imagine faith as a substance or like a human trying to cross the two feet door. What happens? You open it four feet, slightly higher, and then your faith is going to come, you put it down again. And then faith wait. Then you open it, it tries to come, down, you put it again. Faith cannot flow. Once the flow cannot flow, it's just like uh, uh, you have a little uh, water thing uh, at the back where you turn on the thing and you get the water. Suppose that you want a cup of water. Is it come? Let me pour a cup of water for you. And you hold your cup there. Is it ready? Is it good? Then I will on it, switch it off. On it, switch it off. On it, switch it off. And each time you say, one tiny drop. Sometimes almost like, chick, 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 chick. I tell you, until night time, you still haven't filled a cup. Very hard to flow. That's what's happening when, when you keep switching. And you cannot line up steadily in God. So we must have the mind of Christ. But the other more important thing that Jesus spent two verses on was forgiveness. Forgiveness. Let's have a look at that. That's your emotions lining up with God. In Mark chapter 11, verse 25-26. And I'd like to point to what it means here. Because in the Lord's Prayer, He says the same thing. That is in Matthew 6. Where He says in verse 26, If you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now at first, it looks like God won't forgive you if you don't forgive. Doesn't that sound like that in the English? But God showed me in the spiritual world what forgiveness is like. See, in the spiritual world, I saw people who have all kinds of problems entering the spiritual world after they die. And God showed me a, a person who, who went into the spiritual world, and that li person's life is alright. It's alright with God, knows God. But the person had unforgiveness. Unforgiveness against another person who also died. It shows me some, that before he died and after he died. So after he died, he still had unforgiveness. In his heart. And uh, the person who hurt him was walking, of course, on the lower level. That's why the person is like a, like a cactus. Everywhere they go, you know, they hurt somebody. You know, it's like one of these uh, cartoons that the children have where they have this armor. And uh, this armor is all pokey. So your armor is a cactus armor. So you put on your armor, ching, and uh, you look like a cactus. So instead of Superman, you're super cactus. So you go around, you know, you know, and everyone in the good near you, and you hurt them, and you hurt them. So of course, a person who hurts others is walking on a lower level. And so, 
I saw this person, and uh, he's, he's, he's got a lot of problems and, 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 and doesn't really know God. And so this person is hurting. And I saw this, this person who died, whose life was reasonably alright except for unforgiveness against that guy. And so this person tries to go higher. And every time they go higher, it was like a magnetic force. Keep pulling this person to the person he couldn't forgive. So every time he wanted to go higher and, and, the, and try to ascend higher into the higher plane, it was like a rubber band. He goes, oh, and he goes, oing, oh, oing. Of course, minus the sound effect. <laughs> the preacher would have said, all these cartoon sound effects. That's just for you. And <clears throat> so every time he goes, he gets pulled back. And he keeps being drawn to the early ram, into this person. Couldn't ascend. And uh, then when this uh, uh, person who hurts him dies, this person goes into the dark realm where all, you know, the, 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 the people who are hurting others are grouped together. And guess what? When he went into that dark realm, because of the tie of unforgiveness, which caused a magnetism between them, some, I, I got no other uh, word, so I call it magnetism, right? These are things that we are just describing. So, although, although, they are separate in spiritual level. But the first person who has unforgiveness keeps on being poor. And when the person died, uh, the, the, the bad guy died and goes into the dark area. And as he descends into the dark area, guess what? The two are attached by some sort of invisible string and magnetism. And as he goes deeper, that guy is pulled lower. <laughs> And then this guy will say, Hey, what's happening to me? I'm going lower. Because the other guy was going lower. And how far they are. Imagine if you go to the camp this morning, and I tie you to somebody else with a three feet long rope. So wherever you go, this person follows you, correct? Wherever you go, this person follows you. So, you know, one of you may want to go across the road and eat dark rice. But the other guy said, no, I'm going to eat roti chanai along the road. So guess what? On the street out there, both of you cannot eat anything. Because one's going to go this way, one's going to go that way. You're both tugging. Oh, oh. Right. Couldn't go anywhere. How long and how short that string that you tie to a person in unforgiveness depends on the intensity and the area of unforgiveness. The more intense more Thai. Very, very, very super intense Siamese twins. Lose unforgiveness, at least there's a distance. But I found that everywhere, and of course, the one that is gravitationally heavier puts the lighter one down. And I saw that when So it's not because God couldn't forgive you. God wants to forgive us. God loves to forgive us. God is able to forgive us. But, only when we forgive, could we sever the tie to the one we did not forgive. And God released. That is why the scriptures are very, very clear in the way it's uh, worded. Look at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. Which, always, which talks about the same thing in verse 12. And forgive us, Matthew 6 verse 12, and forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive our debtors. The key word is the word as. As. As you forgive, God forgives. Not because God could not. 
Not because God did not want to. But because by your free choice, you're preventing God's forgiveness from being released in you. Whomever you have something against, whether you like it or not, you're tied and bonded to the person. Haven't you noticed that sometimes the people who don't like something and go against something with all their energy, somewhere along their life, they become like the very thing they don't like. Because they absorb all the magnetism from the person and it's tied and transmitted. Instead of looking to the person, they should be looking to Christ. So that's what it means, unforgiveness and forgiveness in the spiritual world. It's frightening. You could be the most angelic saint. You walk so close with God that you're almost an angel floating. But you just have one unforgiveness. It's like a chain around your neck. <coughs> Imagine a beautiful looking angel. Light-footed. Even worshipping in this manner. All you have to do is add shoes of weight like those a prisoner have. Hang a heavy millstone around the neck. And let that little angel try to dance. It will go something like... Instead of looking, walking like an angel, it will be more like Quasimodo. No more beauty, no more grace. That's what the Bible says. Unless you forgive, God cannot forgive you. But not because God couldn't powerfully or didn't want to because the law of unforgiveness and forgiveness is your tie to those you do not forgive. There's a magnetic tie. And therefore God wants us to always release love. That is why no matter what happens in your life, in, in, in human life, in, even in Christian life, we don't choose our own brothers and sisters. God chooses them. I like what Pastor Young said when he was when we were talking about all the pastors, you know, trying to get together to be united, and he's trying to do something, unite all the pastors in the, in Singapore, and he says, same father, different mother, <laughs> because all from different denominations, you know, God the Father begot us, but our denominations make us what we are. So one denomination, you know, all this funny doctrine, the other denomination, all the other funny doctrine. And then we cannot see eye to eye, even though we both love Jesus. Even though we both sing the same song, I love you. Even though we love amazing grace. But I say, I don't want to be that near that person. Same father, different mothers. The mothers are our denominations. They make us so different. And that's, you know... Uh, what he said. So that's, I thought, a very, very interesting comment. We need to forgive. We need to release love. Like Sunnah Singh used to say, whatever happens to any one of us, remember, if children throw stones at a fruit tree, in the first place, if you walk with God, you will have stones thrown to you. Because Jesus says, in the world you shall receive tribulation. The righteous are always persecuted by the unrighteous. If you are a lovely tree full of fruit, and little children, when they, when, they, when they see a tree, they throw sticks and stones at the tree. Why? Because they want the fruit. And so, when sticks and stones are thrown at you, don't throw stones and sticks back. Let the fruit down. Here it is. Zheng, zheng, zheng. So Sunda Singh says, when people throw stones at you, you just give up fruits. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meanness, temperance. The only reaction is love. I hate you. I love you. I don't like you. I love you. Wasn't that what David Wilkinson did to Nikki Cruz? 
And Nick Wilkerson, I cut you to a thousand pieces. And David Wilkerson says, every one thousand of those pieces will say, I love you. Now, how can you receive that kind of love? Isn't that what made us all fall in love with God? We are all naughty children, uh, rascals, sinners, and en- enemies of God. God says, I love you. This is how much I love you. He keeps loving us until we just say, I'm sorry, Father. And then we return to Him like the prodigal son. So when sticks and stones and, and things are thrown in your life, don't, don't get into unforgiveness. Don't be like the fruit tree that say the aims is branches and then let go of its branches, bang, and kills them. <laughs> you know, it sometimes happens when a thunderstorm, a branch falls down, so they get killed. No, just release your fruit. So the way is to walk in love, to release love, and when your emotions are full of love, Bible tells us in the book of Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, and uh, while we are turning to that, let me tell you, I've been in the ministry for about uh, 32, 33 years. I've seen all kinds of things. And I can tell you this. If you are in a ministry, you either grow to be a more loving person, or you grow to be a more bitter person. Just like uh, some of you who are old enough in life, you're in your 50s or 60s, you know this is true. That as you grow in life, You've seen more things. You, you've seen uh, all kinds of things uh, humans do to one another. And you either grow to be a kind, lovely, elderly man or woman. Or you grow to be an obnoxious, you know, uh, cynical, uh, bitter old man or woman. Because it's just an accumulation of experiences, good and bad. And you've got to keep releasing those bad experiences and uh, releasing love so that you could become more and more loving. And remember this, you are on this planet to grow. And the only way to grow in love, let's say uh, your love is at uh, 5 voltage. Someone hits you with 5 voltage. You increase it to 10 voltage. To love the person. So that the person can feel the love. Because five, minus 5 plus 5 is 0. So you have to increase to plus 10. Then the person starts feeling plus 5 love. But actually your love was plus 10. And you succeed in loving the person. Guess what? You have grown. You have now become a plus 10 loving person. Instead of a plus 5. So every time the devil throws something against you, and, and every time people behave like dogs or unjang or all kinds of things against you, and, and this is a good say, you know, when someone barks at you, like a dog, you don't have to be a dog and bark back. Because when they bark at you, and then you go so upset, you bark at them. Ruff, 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 ruff. Wait till you see my dog. At home, I, I used to have a dog that is about, how many pounds was he? About 80 kilos. Huge Alaskan Malamud. The cutest dog in the world. You type on the, on the internet, Alaskan Malamud. Then you see the greyish white one. Cute. James fell in love with him. I had to feed him chicken by hand. <laughs> Huge. All you have to do, look at him and you'll be a good person. <laughs> Huge. And uh, he's a nice dog. Attends church, attends overnight prayer, attends prayer meeting. Uh, we, we, we took Lord's Supper and then he also came and asked for Lord's Supper. And uh, so because we sanctify the thing, he said, no, let me give you something similar, grape juice. <laughs> and he takes grape juice. And one fine day, somebody was staying in my house from Melbourne and I was laying hands and my dog came, look at me. And put his paw on him. His girl, I lay hands, he lay paws. <laughs> so when someone barks and you bark at, and when he growls, he growls, he doesn't bark. Quiet fellow. But when he makes a noise, sounds like a roaring light. <laughs> and uh, so, 
frightens everyone now. So when someone barks at you and you bark at them, and the other person runs away, he runs away, like a little dog with a tail between the legs, congratulations, you just become a bigger dog. You are now the dog. So you, chase a, you became a dog to chase the other dog. So you became a dog. So when someone becomes a dog, don't become a dog, be human. And you're overcome by love. And you become a greater loving person. And that's the way that God wants us to walk our life. In Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But faith energized, and that's the Greek word, works is the word energized, energized by or through love. So when we walk in love, your faith is energized. So you can see that Mark 11, 23, 24, you get your mind into the mind of Christ. You get your love into the love of Christ. And uh, the love of Christ or the affection of Christ or the feelings of Christ. Philippians chapter 1 calls it the splatna of Christ. Whatever people do to Paul, he always says, love just pours out from him. He calls it the affections of Christ. Let me read that scripture for you. Philippians chapter 1, Paul says here, yeah, in verse 8, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the splatna or affections of Christ. The word splatna has been translated in Matthew 14 and other places as the compassion of Christ. Of, that means it's not your compassion or your love, it's Christ's love. So when your mind becomes a mind of Christ, when your emotions become the emotions or affections of Jesus, you got two thirds of your soul. Line up. Then your will must be like the will of the persistent widow coming against the unjust judge. She kept on and kept on and kept on until even the unjust judge says, I have to do something. It was an illustration of persistent will. But it's not just willpower, it is desire. Power. Remember this. Have any one of you ever struggled doing something you desire? Never. But you struggle with something you don't desire. Some of you may love certain foods. Let's say durian. You know, not everybody loves durian. But let's say you love durian. Let's say you are durian connoisseur. You got D24, you know, and D3.145. That's pie. <laughs> pie of a durian. And you get all this, and you know every flavor, and you just are connoisseur. And I say, hey, there's durian over here. Do you think you'll be struggling to eat? But if I take someone who hates durian, don't like durian, of whom the smell just turns you off. Some people say, smells like heaven, tastes like hell. Mm -hmm. And you just cannot stand it. And uh, I remember one time I teased a missionary when he came. And he just couldn't stand your rent. And when he goes near a stall, he goes, mm -hmm. the toilet fruit, he calls it. What an insult to all our tastes. So I had to disturb him back. So one day I bought him ice cream. Do you have ice cream? <laughs> I said, here, try some ice cream. He said, that looks nice. Yes, nice, try. He tries, oh, durian! But then, because it was ice cream, he tried, and guess what? He liked durian. It was just a taste he couldn't get across. Uh, just a smell. So when you get past the smell, it tastes like custard. And the next round when he came, he was a missionary uh, based in Houston. He came and stayed with our house. The next time he came, he says, let's go for durian. <laughs> and you should see him. 
I thought my father was a fantastic durian eater. I can only eat one or two seeds. Now my father eats durians by the whole biji. <laughs> by the whole fruit. And uh, uh, my, uh, my, you know, so when he buys durian during the durian season, he doesn't buy by the catty or the kilogram. He buys by the baskets. Whole house was full of durian. <laughs> and so... Uh, when we go out, you should see him eating the durian. He, he could eat more than me. And then he was with his hands all dipping. Oh, come on, Pastor Peter. This is nice. This one is a good one. Now he tells me which one is good. So he got past that. You never struggle with something you love and desire. Your will is not so much will, your desire. How much do you want what you pray for? How much do you desire? Does it mean more, to, more than life to you? I know some pastors don't believe in, in, in fasting and, and, and seeking God. But let me tell you, if, if your desire is so great for something, you don't even want food. You want what you want more than food. And it drives you constantly to seek after those things. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, Philippians 2 verse 13. For it is God who works in you. And here's another time where the word energizes in you. It's God who energizes in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. So what God does is it energizes a desire in you that causes you to will. Not your will, but the will of God. So notice, love energizes faith. And here, God energizes your will. So you don't depend on your own will to want something. If something is God's will, you yield to God, the desire grows stronger. And stronger. And as it grows strong, you want it more than life. That is why Mark 11, 23, 24, goes to 25, 26, and tells you in verse 22, have the faith of God. And that faith, you must not block it with doubts. You must not block it with unforgiveness. And you must persist in your will. So your soul has three parts, intellect, emotions, and will. When your intellect is lined up with God's mind, your emotions are lined up with the affections of Christ, your will is lined up with God's will, the gift of faith just flows. And it's so easy to believe God for miracles. So easy to move mountains because it's not your faith, but it's God's faith. Inside you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask, Lord, that you establish the gift of faith and the working of the gift of faith in our lives. Help us, Lord, to think the thoughts of faith. To feel the feelings of faith. To will the will of God. For when our will... Emotions and intellect is in line up with you. We know, God, that your faith carries us. Your faith sustains us. Your faith helps us to walk over the mountain, through the mountain, around the mountain, or blast the whole mountain away. It's not us, but your faith. So teach us to yield to Christ in us. Teach us to yield to your faith in us. Teach us to yield to your love, to your thoughts, to your desires. And Father, your will be done in every life. And we pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. Whatever, Lord, that they desire from you, whatever they believe in God in you for, whether it be spiritual, material, ministry, or secular, Father, we pray that you will release an understanding into the hearts and lives right now. 
Where before they are trying to allow your faith to flow with one third of their soul yielded. Help them to yield two thirds and then all of their soul. So that your energy could energize each one of us. And cause us, O Lord, to feel the mighty flow of the faith of God. Doing the mighty works of God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.